Uh, hi, my name is Sandy Cormack. I'm an organizational development consultant and uh, welcome to my training video. This is called Self-Awareness, How Your Personality Drives Career Success. I've created this uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, if you're going to be looking at some of my other training videos, self-awareness is something that I use as a foundational concept. So if you want to get the most out of those, you should probably look at this one first. Uh, second of all, I've created this uh, for three groups of people, really. Uh, all professionals, individual professionals who want to achieve peak career performance and advancement. Uh, also, uh, managers uh, who want to learn how to maximize team performance. The concepts that I'm going to talk about today are extremely useful for uh, helping dysfunctional teams and creating a high performing team. And also all corporate and HR leaders who want to learn how to manage, develop, and motivate their workforce. So uh, for individuals, for teams, and entire organizations, the concepts that I'm going to talk about today are extremely useful. So my goals uh, for you today are, first of all, to understand the things that drive peak career performance, to understand how to achieve self-awareness through personality assessment, and to get an overview of where you can apply this knowledge, and uh, helping you to understand the other videos that are, that are in my channel here. And this is really a quick overview of a complete workshop. When I do a... Uh, a self-awareness workshop. Uh, it can take anywhere from two to four hours depending upon what we use and the size of the group. And this is just a, a quick overview just to give you a general idea of the concepts that we cover. Uh, it's no substitute because it doesn't have a lot of activities, but I do uh, have three activities in here that will help you understand the concepts that we're talking about. So what drives peak career performance? Um, a lot of times uh, we assume that the things that drive per keep, uh, excuse me, peak career performance are things like uh, talent, ability, uh, knowledge, intelligence. In other words, if I get an intelligent person and I put them into this role, they're going to do a good job. Um, but that's really not true because what we see is that there are people who are very high, uh, highly intelligent who don't perform well. We see people who are highly intelligent that do perform well. Intelligence is the key factor here. Uh, skills, same, same, uh, same situation. Highly skilled or not so skilled. Or highly skilled people can perform very well, uh, or not very well. Uh, so these are the things that really don't cord, uh, cor correlate that strongly uh, with performance. But there are two factors that have an overwhelming impact on career success. And one of those is self-awareness, which is what we're going to talk about today. Self-awareness is really knowing yourself. It's understanding who you are, understanding your strengths and your blind spots, and then authenticity, being true to yourself, putting yourself in a position to succeed on a daily basis by being in a career, being in a situation where you can rely on those strengths and avoid those blind spots. So we're talking about understanding who you are and being in a situation that fits who you are. Um, so I like to encapsulate that in this one quote. It's not what you know, it's who you are. This has a lot of relevance to the individual trying to maximize their career performance. Also for the people who are looking to hire for a role. Uh, the, how do we find the right type of person to fit into this role? And how do we achieve self-awareness? Um, that's really where I come in. This is the, the thing that I do uh, for organizations and individuals. Um, the best way to achieve self-awareness is through personality assessments. Uh, I use a trio of uh, personality assessments called Advanced Insights. Um, the DISC that looks at behaviors, the Attribute Index that looks at how you think, and the Values Index that looks at what motivates you. And I find that across the three, we can learn a whole lot about an individual. There are uh, dozens of attributes that we can look at uh, by using three. Um, I don't want to use more than three on a normal basis because I find three to be sufficient. And um, 
The reason I use personality assessments is, first of all, they give you a really deep insight into your strengths and blind spots. And it is just important, as important to understand your blind spots as it does to understand your strengths. You have a lot of strengths that come through your personality. Um, but there are also things that you need to be aware of that are blind spots for you that are also part of your personality. And through this, you can also understand how you learn, how you lead, how you communicate, and in what type of job climate you will thrive. Okay, so when you're thinking about, will I do well in this career, you have to not only consider the aspects of the career, but the, the culture of the organization that you're going into. Uh, will I fit? Is this going to give me the type of work environment that will allow me to thrive? And then it also serves as a complete guide for professional development. Each one of the uh, assessments that I use has sort of a little uh, self-examination um, section in it that enables you to connect your strengths with what's required to do your job. And so uh, these are especially well attuned to careers. And that's why I like to use these three assessments. And here's sort of how they work. I like to use this metaphor uh, for understanding how the brain works. And the metaphor is simply here. We have a flotation device. And the flotation device, you can, it's just like a, a, a boy sitting on a lake. And the flotation device is tethered to a weight, which is then attached to an anchor. And if you've ever seen a flotation device on a lake, it tends to just sit there. And then if the wind blows or there's a storm, it can move. It moves around the, where the wind blows it, where the waves take it. But then eventually, when things calm down, it settles down back to its original position. And this is the metaphor that we use for behaviors. And I use the disk index to measure behaviors. The disk index can tell me your steady state behaviors, how you really prefer to, to behave, and also how you behave when the wind's blowing, when there's a crisis situation, when there's a high velocity situation, when you're being watched, how your behaviors flex. And those are two things that are really uh, key to be aware of. And then this tethered to the anchor here, or I'm sorry, the weight, the weight keeps it from moving that far and the weight itself doesn't move around very much and we use this as the metaphor for your values the why and these are the things that drive and motivate you um, those uh, motivators that you have those passions those values that you have don't move around that much over time they tend to stay pretty stable and um, the why uh, for an individual is extremely important to understand um, it's the key to finding a situation uh, that you're going to thrive in. It's also the key to understand how your employees are motivated, how your workforce can be motivated, and how to determine in which type of, of positions an individual can fit best. And then finally, the anchor here at the bottom, the attribute index measures how you think. And as the metaphor suggests, you, the way you think stays pretty consistent over time and only maybe evolves glacially, but it just stays uh, pretty steady, pretty rock solid. Uh, it's more about your cognitive uh, uh, attributes, the way you think uh, deeply, the, uh, the neuroscience of your brain, things, are, things of that nature. And I use the attribute index, as I said, to measure that in three uh, fundamental thinking aspects. And I like this metaphor because people see how you behave a lot more clearly than what, what motivates you and how you think. Um, they can see the, the boy floating on the lake, but they can't see what's underneath the lake very clearly unless they know you very well. Um, that's why I prefer to use this metaphor. So let's take a look at the first one, the how you behave. And I use the DISC index to measure that. This version of the DISC index is defined uh, as four um, uh, attributes, four dimensions, 
decisive, interactive, stabilizing, and cautious. And this cheat sheet here comes from the actual disk report that you get when you take it. Um, so decisive, the first red column there, uh, refers to how you tend to approach problems and make decisions. So uh, imagine you've got a problem that's put in front of you. Somebody with a very high D score will attack that problem extremely forcefully and driving uh, because they want to get around that problem. It's an impediment to them moving forward. So they tend to make decisions pretty quickly and uh, they don't want to spend a lot of time examining the problem. Whereas somebody with a lower DISC score is more contemplative. They will go in and, and examine the problem. They'll talk to people. They'll collect data about the problem. They want to take their time to uh, to come up with a solution. They want to take a more reasoned approach. And this is why the high D individual uh, often seems angry, uh, because that emotion, uh, the, 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 the tougher the problem or the more annoying the problem, the more the high D individual will display the emotion of anger. The yellow column here, interactive, this is how you interact with others and share opinions. So we associate the high I score people with, be, with being more extroverted, gregarious, persuasive, inspiring. Um, this is going to be the first person that talks in a meeting. This is going to be the person that makes chit chat and small talk. They like to establish a uh, rapport. The lower I people, more introverted, more contemplative, uh, more reserved, more introspective. If they're in a meeting, they might not say a word during a meeting. Then stabilizing the green column. This uh, looks at three things. Um, and it, it's t how you tend to pace things in your environment is the first thing that it looks at. Uh, people with a high S tend to like a slower paced environment, work environment. Uh, it also looks at your um, your need or your desire to be in a team environment. People with a high S like to be part of a team. And then the third aspect is harmony. They like to be part of a team that gets along well, that cooperates with one another, that collaborates with one another. The lower S scores can take a much faster pace, much more competitive environment, and don't really care about a harmonious situation. They can, they like conflict a lot, a lot of times. You'll see that they, they can also uh, almost thrive in a com, uh, conflict environment. Then the cautious, the blue column, C. Um, this looks at procedures, your preference for established protocol and standards. So the high C people tend to be very precise, perfectionist, systematic, quality focused, attention to detail, um, like lots of uh, protocols and plans and procedures, very procedural, low C people, more loosey-goosey, dynamic situations, uh, not a lot of rules to follow. And on the uh, right here, this is a sample uh, report graphic uh, that shows how the scores are, are displayed. Um, scores between 0 and 100. The red bars indicate, or the uh, the colored bars indicate um, your natural behavioral pattern, and then the gray bars indicate that um, the pattern that I was discussing earlier, how you flex during a crisis situation, during a high velocity situation. So this is just a very quick overview of the disc and how it relates to careers. The high D. Uh, People tend to be, tend to gravitate to careers where you get uh, fast results, where they can really take charge and direct and control and get things done. The high I people will gravitate towards jobs where they get to work with people and build relationships and establish rapport. The high S will like to support people. So supporting clients, helping others, working on a team in a slower paced environment. And then the high C will look for positions where they can uh, uh, utilize their quality focus, 
their uh, their precision. They maybe will like to create and work within processes and procedures, managing outcomes, and be in an operational role rather than strategic. So to understand this, I have an activity that I do at all workshops. And this is um, coming up with an ideal set of behaviors for a specific job, a specific career. And the one I'm using today is customer service representative. So think about what a cursed customer service representative does. And I've got the cheat sheet here for you to look at with the D, I, S, and C attributes. Look at that list of words and think about what a customer service rep does and, and determine there are two ideal high behaviors for a customer service rep. I want you to pick the two. So pause the video right now and write down what you think those might be. Okay, so hopefully you've picked the two. Um, and I'm going to give you the solution right now for a customer service rep. We're looking for a high I and a high S. We actually have a statistical benchmark for a number of careers, and customer service rep is one of them, where we've had hundreds of people take the profile and we correlate the results um, <clears throat> with high performance in a given role. And for customer service rep, we, we take you know hundreds of high performing customer service reps and we've statistically analyzed their results. And we, what we've determined is high I and high S is prevalent in high performing um, customer service reps disk reports. And so that gives you uh, an idea. If you have a high I and high S, you can consider a role like customer service. If you are hiring for a, a customer service person, this is what you should look for in an individual. Um, who has sort of the natural customer service um, personality. So now let's move on to the next one, which is the values index. This is your drivers and motivators. Um, so there are seven attributes that we look at. Uh, aesthetic, economic, individualistic, political, altruistic, regulatory, and theoretical. Um, so I want to go through each one of them again. The aesthetic is the drive for form, harmony, beauty, and balance. Um, people with a high aesthetic tend to go into careers uh, where they uh, can uh, uh, use this drive in a way that, that brings about like uh, things like design, um, order, um, form versus function, things like that. So you can think of a number of careers that would be associated with that. They also like to have a, a very well delineated work life balance. Um, economic is the drive for money, practical results and return on investment. Um, so money is the reward for somebody with a high economic drive, not only working uh, to earn money, but maybe working with money, uh, any career that involves uh, return on investment, uh, risk versus reward, uh, cost benefits analysis, things like that. Uh, individualistic is the drive <clears throat> to do things your own way. So independence and uniqueness. Um, the individualist, uh, if you really want to kill the drive of an individualist, put them under a micromanager. A micromanager will stifle their creative energy. <clears throat> the individualist likes to do things their own way, so they will come up with a way, a procedure of doing th of, of doing things that works for them. And as a result, they tend to have a very strong personal brand. They like to become sort of the go-to person for what they do. Political is the drive to be in charge. It's, uh, it's all about control, power, and influence. So, of course, we would, it's, we would expect people uh, who gravitate to leadership roles to have a drive, a high uh, political drive. And they also like sort of the power and prestige that comes with those roles. If you want to reward somebody with high political, you give them a promotion. You give them the uh, corner office. <clears throat> Altruistic is the drive to help others selflessly, putting others' needs ahead of your own. And you can think of tons of careers uh, in the medical field, in nonprofits, where this would be 
a, a strong attribute to have. They will often put them uh, others' needs ahead of their own to the point where um, they neglect themselves. So this is a coaching point uh, I like to explore with most people um, who display high altruism. Regulatory is the drive for structure, order, and routine um, to be in a structured environment. Uh, somebody with high regulatory drive wants to be in a structured environment. If the structure doesn't exist, they might make it themselves. They might create their own structure. And then finally, theoretical, it's the drive to learn, to acquire knowledge and understanding. Um, think of a PhD, um, an academian, somebody who's a lifelong learner. They will often learn for the sake of learning if they have a very high uh, theoretical drive. And they're really good to have if you're exploring things, if you're trying to determine the root cause of problems. <clears throat> they can be a detriment if they want to analyze and analyze and analyze without moving forward. So paralysis by analysis. So that's another point that I like to explore when I'm coaching an individual with a high theoretical. And again, the on the right here, you see the report. All seven shown on a very similar to the disc type of display between zero and 100. And with the um, um, with the values index, we're looking at the scores that are above this little gray box, which represents one standard deviation of everyone who's ever taken the assessment um, as high or low if it's below the little gray box. So this person's high motivators are individualistic, theoretical, altruistic, and aesthetic. They have four. I've seen people have as few as two. I've seen people have up to five. So um, it, it's all over the place. And it's extremely valuable to learn. I find that this particular assessment uh, really interests individuals strongly and really engages them. Uh, values index and careers, uh, high aesthetic, um, somebody with a high aesthetic will gravitate towards something that allows them uh, to express themselves artistically, to design things, to use their creativity. Uh, high economic uh, dr driven people will look for uh, financial reward, working with financial matters. Uh, high individualistic people will look for a career where they can do things their own way, establish their own personal brand, and be known as the expert. High political will look for opportunities for them to be in charge, if not at first, then to give them a pathway to move into a leadership role, to manage things, to make tough decisions. Um, the high altruist looking for an engagement that will let them help others, take care of others, put others' needs ahead of their own. The high regulatory, work in a structured environment, administer rules and regs, create structure where none exists. And then the high theoretical will look for an engagement that allow them to solve problems. They tend to be natural problem solvers, uh, seek to understand the problem through research, analyze and test, get to the root. So that's just a very quick overview of the career association with the values index. And let's do the same activity that we did for customer service rep. There are three ideal motivators, statistically speaking, for a customer service rep. Pause the video now, use this little cheat sheet here, and come up with what those three would be. And uh, I'll uh, move on after you've had an opportunity, so pause the video. Okay, let's take a look at the solution. So for a customer service rep, we're looking at three things, the aesthetic, the altruistic, and the regulatory. The reason that we're looking for these three, first of all, the uh, altruist should probably jump right out because um, customer service reps help others. So they should have an altruistic drive, an altruistic passion to help others. Aesthetic, because they want to achieve a harmonious outcome with the individual. They want to make that individual happy. They want to create sort of a, a natural balance. Um, you know, the person comes to them out of balance. They want to create that balance. And regulatory, because customer service 
uh, roles tend to be more uh, structural. There tend to be a procedure and a way of doing things with the customer service uh, role. So those are the three that you'd be looking at for a customer service person. <clears throat> and then finally, the attribute index. The attribute index is about 10 times more powerful than the other two. And for today, I'm only going to be looking at half of it. And this is the half that is external. The attribute index has a section that looks at how you think uh, externally and then how you think internally, how you think about yourself. For careers, we're going to be looking at the externals. So it looks at three external thinking attributes. Empathy, practical thinking, and systems judgment. So empathy is um, what you think it is. Empathy is understanding others, being able to put yourself in other person's shoes, uh, having sensitivity towards the emotions of others, understanding their attitudes, being able to read others. All right. The practical thinking is all about getting things done. So somebody with pra high practical thinking is more of a tactical planner. What do I need to do? What do I need to do to execute this? They're all about execution and implementation. They want to get things done quickly and, and they're flexible because they know that they're going to encounter obstacles and they need to, to sort of bob and weave to get things done. And they tend to be more results oriented. Systems judgment is all about strategic thinking, strategic planning, theoretical problem solving. They can see potential problems. They like to work with complex systems and they tend to look at things in the big picture. And with the attribute index, we look at uh, empathy, practical thinking and systems judgment on a scale of zero to 10. And we are primarily looking at order here. These three are what we call clarity indicators. So the higher the score, the more clear that thinking attribute is in you and functions in you. And we look at the order. Um, um, and also, <clears throat> the higher the score, the more you tend to use this thinking attribute intuitively. Um, with regard to careers, somebody with high empathy, again, looks to help others, to develop others, to persuade others more uh, interested in teamwork. Practical thinking uh, looks for opportunities where they can get things done on a daily basis and focus on results and have attention to detail. And then systems judgment uh, thinking uh, people like to be in a situation where they can solve problems, where they can be in a, a role where they think strategically and, and big picture thinking and uh, analyze. Um, and develop systems and procedures. So with that in mind, let's go back to our example about customer service rep. And I'm going to move my window here, my window here, so you can see all of this. The, um, the cheat sheet here, then think about what a customer service rep does. Apply what you understand, and then determine the order of those three. Assume that all three of them uh, are there for an individual. Put them in order of highest to lowest for a customer service rep. So uh, pause the video, come up with that, and then we'll move forward. Okay, let me move my video window back here. And let's take a look at the solution. For a customer service rep, the highest we would be looking for is empathy, followed by practical thinking, and then systems judgment. Empathy, because again, you're working with people, you need to understand them intuitively, you need to be able to read individuals, put yourself in their shoes to get a clear understanding of their problem. Practical thinking, because you need to go through the steps to get things done and help them solve their problem. And then system judgment is a third, distant third. It really doesn't weigh that heavily. Not as heavy as the, the other two. So that's what we've been able to, to develop here is actually a career benchmark. Disk, values, and attribute index. A, using them, de developing a statistical career benchmark on 
how you, how the ideal high performing customer service rep thinks, behaves, and what motivates them. And this is extremely useful and powerful. You can do this for any career. So here's how we put uh, advanced insights to use in a team environment. I would take them in a workshop, a group workshop lasting anywhere from two to four hours. And we would use it to first identify individual strengths and blind spots, get an understanding of the model, just as we have done here, take a little more time with it to get a more clear understanding, and then uh, understand your personal report, the, your assessment results, to gain that self-awareness. That's the first step. The second step is to understand the strengths and blind spots of your teammates. So you can compare your results with the results of your teammates. You can understand, hey, here are the things that we have in common at all three levels. Our behaviors, our values, our thinking attributes. Here are the things we have in common. Here are the things that were different. Maybe when uh, this is a blind spot for me, but it's a strength for you. Maybe we can help each other out here. And this creates team awareness and it builds trust. It's, it, when you go through these activities, it's a natural trust building um, experience because you understand people now in a way that you haven't before. You now understand why they think differently from you, why they behave differently from you. It's not that they're being a jerk. It's that this is just how, how they do things. And there's a value in how they do things, just as there are value in how you do things. Then you can go in to the report and you can complete the self-assessments and create individual development plans. You can determine, hey, here are the things that I need to work on. The assessment says, maybe I need a little more attention to detail, depending on how. Maybe this blind spot, I don't see this. Uh, maybe I need to work through my strengths in a way that, that can make up for this blind spot. And you can work out your own professional development plan that way. Then finally, you can use this as a foundation for a complete team development program. So learning how to have constructive conflict, learning accountability, learning to have a results focus, building communication skills, building leadership skills, all sorts of things. So this is how it can serve sort of as the foundation for complete team development. And self-awareness, as we've gone through today, is the capstone of all sorts of other things, starting at the very top here, leadership skills. Your personality drives how you lead. You all have a preferred leadership style based on your personality. So when you get the self-awareness of your personality, you can now obtain self-awareness of how you're, you lead and you can learn how to apply that situationally to give an individual what they need to be more successful. Communication skills. You have a natural communication style that comes from your personality, mostly involved in how you uh, behave. And we can take that, those behavioral attributes and come up with individual communication strategies for the people that you work with. Team performance, as we just discussed. It's the foundation of team performance. You, you build trust and can use it as a way of, of building a really high performing team. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is, it, you, you may have heard of the term, but it's a way that for you to understand your emotions and how to manage your own emotions better and to manage your professional and personal relationships better. Uh, the attribute index has an emotional intelligence version that lays out your emotional intelligence attributes in a very clear form. And so you can sort of assess your own emotional intelligence and come up with strategies to improve your uh, emotional intelligence, your ability to manage yourself. Talent acquisition. We just went through a career benchmark exercise. All sorts of uh, benchmarks already exist, and you can build new benchmarks from the results of these assessments. So it can be the cornerstone of your talent acquisition strategy. Interpersonal skills. There are all sorts of interpersonal skills that are influenced by your personality, 
I would take this if I was doing an interpersonal skills training program first so that you can custom tailor the, uh, the interpersonal skills plan to the individual's needs. Managing change and creativity and innovation I want to talk about together because they're linked. Creativity and innovation is all about creating change. Managing change is the implementation of change and the effect that it has on an organization. The, uh, the personality attributes are a real uh, clear indicator of how you prefer to innovate. Do you have big ideas? Do you have incremental uh, ideas? Do you tend to gravitate towards a continuous improvement? Do you want to change the world, transform the world? And then how do you implement? How do you implement this in a way that it benefits your organization? Um, again, comes from your personality and we can, you know, learn about that. Um, customer service, we just went through that. Uh, the customer service benchmark is a really good uh, indicator of how, you know, you can effectively uh, uh, serve customers not only external to your organization, but internal to your organization. And then retaining employees, uh, the last thing might not be as apparent, but if you have a clear idea of what motivates your workforce through that uh, values index, you can understand the roles and the positions that these people need to have in order to stay motivated. You transform your thinking from how do we motivate our workforce to what motivates our workforce? How is our workforce motivated? And then you can adjust your strategy accordingly and retain employees for a longer period of time if you're continuously engaging them in a way that really drives their passions. So to wrap up, revisiting our goals for today, uh, we, I said I would uh, help you understand what drives peak career performance. We did that. Self-awareness drives peak career performance, self-awareness and authenticity. Next, understand how to achieve self-awareness through personality assessment. We went through that. We also developed the career benchmark for the customer service person to give you an idea of how the three personality assessments uh, align with uh, high performance in careers. And then get, a, get an overview of where you can apply this knowledge. We did that. We uh, took a look at how it can help your team and also the different uh, training engagements that this can serve as a platform for. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to email me at this email address. I'll have a link in the description below. And also, if you would like to set up a Zoom meeting to talk about doing a webinar or something of that nature, I like to work through organizations rather than individuals. So if you're a team leader, a manager, an HR person, and you would like to um, get, get this uh, accomplished for your organization, we can set up a Zoom meeting and talk about it. If you're an individual who would like to take this, I'd prefer to do this through your organization. So talk to your, um, to your HR rep and then they'll, they'll contact me and we can set something up. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. I hope you got a lot out of this training and have a great rest of your day and enjoy the rest of the videos on my channel.